Hello, everyone. My name is Kenneth Horn, Wall Street Channel. I'm the director of research here at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And the MHS is free and open to the public. Anyone can come here and research in our 14 million manuscript pages and counting. And um, that includes the papers of John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, among many other uh, wonderful uh, individuals in our past. We also have a very robust fellowship program now entering its close to its 40th year, and uh, we administer about a quarter of a million dollars worth of fellowship funds every single year to support research in all aspects of American history. We are only able to do this thanks to the generous support of organizations such as the Society of Colonial Wars in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We're highlighting four projects funded by that organization here at the MHS today. Today, we'll start with some remarks from the governor of the, uh, the Society of Colonial Wars in Massachusetts. I shall then introduce each of our presenters in turn. They will each have about 10 to 12 minutes to present. We'll have questions at the end of that from folks in the room as well as online. If you're joining us on Zoom, please use the Q&A function to uh, type in your questions and we'll ask them during that period. Our chief librarian, Peter Drummy, will then talk about how to use the library, how to come do research here. Um, and again, you're very welcome to do so. And uh, after that, we'll have some concluding remarks from another representative of the organization. So first, I'm going to turn this over to the governor of the Society of Colonial Wars in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Michael Aylward. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. A century after the MHS was founded, a group of men got together in a hotel in New York and founded the Society of Colonial Wars. Its purpose is to propagate and preserve the history of the colonial period from Jamestown in 1607 to Lexington Concord in 1775. In Massachusetts, one of the things that we do that we think is most important to that mission is the administration of the Samuel Victor Constant Scholarships. With a fund we created several years ago, each year with the help of the MHS, we identify young scholars in the field of colonial history and give them a stipend to further their particular research. We've done this for quite a while, but this is the first year that we've brought together those scholars to talk to you and to, we have about 100 people on, on, on the Zoom link, about how they're going about their research, what their findings are, and what its importance is to all of us as students of the colonial period here to talk about the Samuel Victor Constant Program and to introduce our speakers is our Educational Committee Chair, Charlie Newhall. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Kit. Um, I am uh, delighted to uh, be here introducing uh, really the Samuel Victor Constant Fund and Scholarship. Uh, I welcome you all here, all of you online as well. Uh, to the Joint Massachusetts Historical Society, Society of Colonial Wars Panel of Scholars. My name is Charlie Newhall, and I have the privilege of chairing the Education Committee of the Society of Colonial Wars in Massachusetts. Thank you, kid, for all you've done to move this forward, um, and also for everybody at the Massachusetts Historical Society who has supported us giving this a home here in Massachusetts. Thank you also to the folks in the General Society, particularly Frank Wyman, who I hope is online, um, and Bill Wood, who is not only uh, our uh, representative here in Massachusetts, but who has represented this fellowship to the General Society for a number of years and really shepherded along in a wonderful way. We're excited to hear about each fellow's research and to share this panel with members uh, of MHS and members of the Colonial Society, as well as the general public. Samuel Victor Constant was one of those men who met in that hotel about 120, 130 years ago. He was a New York lawyer, and as one of the founders of the Society of Colonial Wars, he was dedicated to the history uh, and legacy of the colonial period. Constant was also a member of the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, the Oriental Society, the St. David Society, and the Seventh Regiment. He was also chairman of something called the Movement for Relief of Armenian Christians. This, I think, tells you a little bit about his character. And of course, he was what we call in Massachusetts a colonial warrior. These fellowships run by the Massachusetts Society honor the legacy of John Adams, 
a founding father we all know, and recognized the importance of various of very serious scholarly archival research in early American topics and a broad understanding that help us understand who we are today. Today, the Society of Colonial Wars consists, as Michael told you, of 32 state societies. We reach out with grants to support a variety of historical organizations, often focused on preservation, scholarship, and archives. The Society continues its mission by collecting and preserving manuscripts, rolls, relics, records, erecting monuments, hosting commemorations, and supporting academic research. Our education committee is also planning more outreach to scholars, teachers, and student historians. Our sponsorship of these fellowships and our trust at the and our trust put in the Massachusetts Historical Society to facilitate this work will be evident today. We are pleased to share their insights with you all and thank you for logging in and showing up. Thank you very much. We are going to start off with Abid Alibai. He is a PhD candidate in African and African American studies at Harvard University. He holds a JD from Harvard Law School and is a Dorothy Porter and Charles Harris Wesley Fellow at the Hutchin Center's W.E.B. Du Bois Research Institute. His focus is on the history of the Black Atlantic. Abid. Thank you to KID, MHS, and the Society of Colonial Wars. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, uh, a petition that's very important to my dissertation, um, tentatively titled Belinda's World, Slavery, Legal Activism, and Abolition in Revolutionary New England. Um, you will, the, the um, archival research being done um, through this fellowship um, will, the results of that will be um, presented in my dissertation, but also in a report coming seven, uh, summer of 2023, uh, Global History of uh, Slavery in New England Told Through the Lives of Enslaved People at the Royal House and Slave Quarters, um, and, and an online exhi exhibition that will come out with that report. And uh, that is being done with my, uh, my colleague, the executive director of the Royal House of Slave Quarters, um, an expert on all things um, colonial history, Kiara Singleton. Um, so let's get started. Um, on February 14th, 1783, as news of a peace treaty reached the shores of the, of the young victorious Republic, a West African mother of 70 years delivered a searing indictment of slavery in a powerful case for reparations to the Massachusetts General Court. After five decades of enslaving Belinda Sutton, Isaac Royal owed her money and she came to collect, but Sutton didn't quite say it like that. After all, she was speaking through a formal petition which needed to be dressed with the requisite legal formalities and formulaic niceties, wherefore casting herself at the feet of your honors. And yet Sutton insisted that she be heard. She proceeded beyond what was, or rather what the general court considered to be, directly relevant to the legal issue in question, was she due compensation, and instead inscribed her politics into the written record. A powerful fusion of autobiography and legal text, Sutton's appeal takes us from her birth on the Gold Coast through the torturous Middle Passage, from her decades of enslavement in the Caribbean and Medford, to her then current life supporting her ailing daughter in Boston's Black community. Dubbed the inaugural text of Black women's participation in the American autobiographical genre by literary scholar Joanne Braxton, Sutton's petition is at once exceptional and exemplary. Exceptional because the number of legal petitions authored by an African woman in Massachusetts can be counted on one hand. One would have multiple fingers left over if one tallied, again on one hand, African women's slave narratives that address the Middle Passage. Hers is the Bay State's only legal petition by an individual of any race or sex or status to convey such scorching critiques of slavery. Other petitioners did so only when they had strength in numbers. Exemplary because Sutton's searing indictment of slavery in powerful case for reparations had long been a feature of enslaved people's discourse. 
The experiences she described were suffered by all Africans stolen from their homeland. Exemplary too, because Sutton's petition was one star in a constellation of black abolitionist activism in the revolutionary era, a legacy veiled by the still unthinkable notion that enslaved people theorized the world around them and developed their own ethical commitments that guided their politics. What W.E.B. Du Bois called the philosophy of life and action which slavery bred in the souls of black folk. Sutton took the initiative to go to law and despite holding the pen but briefly to strike an X beside her printed name, she was her petition's primary author, providing its substance and ideas. One would be mistaken to reduce the petition to the, to the words of her legal advocate who remains unknown. As a growing number of legal historians have shown, legal writing in the late 18th century was polyphonic, the product of lived encounters between petitioners or litigants and their advocates. Moreover, Sutton quite conspicuously overrode the legal advice of her advocate. The impassioned account of her life makes it easy to overlook her petition's demand, funds to support herself and her ailing daughter. Sutton was not the first formerly enslaved person petitioning the legislature for relief, and her legal advocate would have advised her to follow the deferential script of her predecessors, like Sutton's own longtime friend, uh, Tony in Cuba Vassal, a formerly enslaved husband and wife duo who, just a couple years prior, had successfully petitioned the legislature for a pension without Sutton's searing political commentary. Sutton refused this legal orthodoxy. Instead, she embarked on a riskier, more radical path. The details of Sutton's life are terribly obscure. We receive most of her biographical details through the unknown intermediary who transcribed the elderly woman's story in that prophetic petition, an appeal lengthier than most at the time, though still a brief 800 words. And so we witness her life as a portrait painted in broad strokes the kind of overarching story that allowed Sutton to deliver a strong, succinct, universal anti-slavery argument to the general court. Mm. Though one that makes it difficult for historians two and a half centuries later to reconstruct her lived experience. But it is a portrait nonetheless, which is considerably more than we can say for tens of millions of other Africans caught up in the slave trade, mm. and one brimming with insights about the enslaved revolutionary era politics. And yet, we have failed to grasp the full meaning of Sutton's words, mm. as we have with much Black intellectual thought in the 18th century. We have failed because, I think, of an assumption, or perhaps more accurately, as the word assumption can apply imply affirmative thought, a deep-seated mental reflex that enslaved people lacked the ability to engage in intellectual discourse beyond appropriating the beliefs of so-called enlightened whites. Recent scholarship on the history of slavery and abolition in Massachusetts has provided a major corrective to earlier works that, ex that excluded the role of enslaved people in their own emancipation. But by limiting the, their contribution to the appropriation of enlightenment discourse from white elites, we have shackled the political and intellectual imaginaries of enslaved people more than their enslavers ever could. One scholar of 18th century African American literature, for instance, has dismissed the significance of Sutton's petition because of the quote general quality or of or the lack of specificity in its biographical details and has deemed the petition, quote, almost certainly fictionalized. In fact, Sutton's, Sutton presented all the specific detail required of her to be considered for and granted what she demanded, financial relief, in the legally required and specific genre, a petition to the general court. She provided her name, her place of birth, her legal status, the name of her enslaver, and his legal status, and the reason she required a pension. The quote, general quality with which Sutton tells her life story, the characteristic that purport, purportedly diminished her petition's import was in fact, 
a deliberate and effective choice on Sutton's part, though we can only see this once we overcome the notion that enslaved people could contribute to the public sphere at most biographical details, that they were not participants in intellectual debates. Mm -hmm. Sutton was advancing a general universal argument against slavery and for reparations. In addition to her plea for financial relief, this was the major objective of her appeal. Unlike most life histories of the time, which made claims to exceptionality, as they needed to be unique and interesting to be profitable, Sutton's point was that her experiences were like those of all enslaved people in fundamental ways that demonstrated that slavery in general was immoral and that justice required reparations for all enslaved and formerly enslaved people. We can take Sutton's depiction of her childhood in West Africa, once a most Eden-like place as she described it, now corrupted by white enslavers, as one instance of the significance of her general biographical details to her anti-slavery argument. Portraying Africa in romantic terms was a common trope among whites who had never been there, and the political significance of Sutton's depiction has been dismissed as the simple appropriation of this trope, despite Sutton using such imagery to elucidate how enslavement corrupts virtuous societies, or uh, it is observed without analysis. To begin with, Sutton's relationship to Africa was different than that of these whites who had never seen the continent. It was her home, and from there she was forcibly enslaved and removed to the Americas. And others, regardless of race or place, have remembered their former land as pastoral after experiencing displacement and great hardship. But my main point here is our inability to imagine enslaved people engaging in intellectual debate with whites and thus our neglect of taking their words seriously and situating them in the political context of their time. We cannot fathom that enslaved people were political thinkers who actively participated in significantly shaped and closely followed legal and intellectual debates throughout the Atlantic world. Africa, Sutton and her enslaved brethren asserted, was a free land never conquered by Europeans, nor had Africans willingly sold them into slavery. Therefore, they concluded, Africans could not be legally enslaved according to Massachusetts statutory law or the law of nations. As the black pastor Lamuel Haynes of Boston put it in 1776, whites were enslaving, quote, innocent blood. They were man-stealing, a practice prescribed by the Bible and punishable by death. Some African Bostonians were more direct than Sutton and her allegorical approach. Quote, I cannot think that one of the sons of Africa that hath tasted the sweets of freedom in their own country and the heavy yoke in this country would submit to slavery. For Africans are a free people born free and were never conquered by any nation. Still, Sutton's allegorical approach was a mode of argument that colonists, that colonists could most certainly comprehend, perhaps even more so than alternative forms of argumentation. Indeed, colonial elites relished the Roman writers of antiquity like Virgil and the modern titans of literature who drew from them, like Phyllis Wheatley's favorite poet, Alexander Pope, who used pastoral imagery to comment on the ravages of war, just as Sutton employed pastoral imagery to emphasize the ravages of European warfare and slaving on African people and society. Sutton used her memory of West Africa to critique white society, but more than that, to advance her own political ideas, her own vision of good society. Colonists would have understood what she was getting at when she inquired, quote, what did it avail her, i.e. Sutton, that the walls of her Lord were hung with splendor and that the dust trodden underfoot her native country, that is gold, crowded his gates with sordid worshipers. Sutton's quote, Lord was her enslaver, Isaac Royal, and, what, and it was this enslaver of men and his voluminous gold, which as Sutton pointed out, was stolen from the blood and sweat of enslaved Africans, like herself, that attracted quote, sordid worshipers. Europeans, she said, worshipped a false god, a golden calf. Sutton contrasted Anglo-Americans who, quote, placed their happiness in gold with a pastoral West Africa where she portrayed a virtuous ethical way of life. Though she lived in a region filled with gold, her people sought happiness in family and freedom and religion. 
we can grasp the power and significance of Sutton's argument when we place it in the political context of her time. A virtuous people, colonists believed, was essential to the success of a republic. Virtue, which meant placing the public good before one's own pecuniary interests, was the linchpin of society, the key to good government and the pursuit of happiness. The opposite of virtue was corruption. Indeed, 18th century intellectuals believed Rome, their lodestar, succeeded for a time as a republic because it was virtuous. The ancient republic fell in their view because virtue gave way to corruption. Likewise, Sutton explained that in West Africa, she would have achieved the highest stage of happiness one could, quote, complete felicity, as she put it, were it not for the, quote, horror and, quote, evil apprehensions that the constant threat of enslavement inflicted upon her. Here, then, was Sutton's stark warning, clear as day, to the colonists ever so worried about sustaining the Republican government they had just created. Slavery, which corrupted society, would lead to the New Republic's downfall. I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop there, but I can answer more questions during the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Daniel Bottino. He attended Tufts University and received a BA in history. He next went to Yale University for an MA in European Studies and is currently working on his doctoral dissertation at Rutgers University under the direction of Professor Alistair Bellany. Latino's field of study broadly includes the social and cultural history of early modern Western Europe and early America. His dissertation explores the landscape history of English colonization in early Maine and he is also actively engaged in research on the life of Patience Boston, a native woman who was hanged for murder in York, Maine in 1735. Exploring the history of Patience Boston has involved a broader study of religious culture and the Great Awakening in 18th century New England. Daniel. Thank you. Set my timer up here so you do not go over time. There we go. So my project is a very image, image heavy project. Uh, to put it simply, my, uh, my fellowship research here focuses on trying to find in the hundreds of thousands of um, documents here as many, as many New England seals, wax seals as possible from the 17th century and into about 1750 is where I generally end. So I've only barely scratched the surface. I probably have looked at about 200 seals so far. And so before I talk about what so far I have learned from these seals, I do want to, I do want to note the general angle uh, of research that I am looking at these seals from. Of course, there are many aspects of the history of these wax seals which are fascinating and which I think should be studied. Now, I, in general, uh, am interested in the history of the interaction of oral culture, oral visual culture, and moderate and modern literate textual culture in the early modern world. But um, I specifically focus on um, on Maine, right over there, um, which I'm glad to see represented here in the map. Um, and so what role then do seals play in, under, in gaining a broader under, under understanding of the interaction of these two world worldviews? Well, seals are fascinating because they are, of course, integral to text, integral to the function of textual, of textual documents. And so in the early modern world in the 16th, in the um, 17th century, 18th century specifically, you have legal documents, you have deeds, wills, charters, and so on, which are of course written documents, but which can only be valid, which can only fully function once the seal, of course they've been signed and then they've been sealed. So the seal is necessary to make them valid documents. Without the seal, these documents do not fully work. 
letters, of course, too. And I think when modern people think of seals, they think of personal letters, which are sealed, closed with the seal, and then sent, of course, tells, which tells you when you get the letter that the letter has not been opened yet. And so seal, seals are necessary to the function of these literate documents. But yet seals are also not textual documents. They are rather physical objects. They function not through text, but they function through physical and visual action. So you use, so of course, the seal is a visual image. And in the action, the seal is not just the wax image. The seal is the whole form and function of the use of the matrix of the seal put in, into the wax at the signing and sealing of these documents, the ritual words spoken, the witnesses viewing the image of the, of the seal. This is not a textual action. This is a pre-modern visual and oral culture, cultural element here. And so seals can be seen as looking, as Michael Clanchy here says, seals are, are literally and figuratively two-faced objects. They look backwards to a pre-modern oral, a pre-modern visual and oral culture, and they look forwards to a modern literate culture. And so in trying to understand the interaction of these two cultures, we need to understand how seals operated in this world. In the colonies, in the 18th, in the 17th and um, into the early 18th centuries in which you have about equal populations of people who are fully literate and people who are not literate. All right, let's take a look at what I found so far. So just some general, ob ob some general thoughts about what the seals I've looked at, what traits they share. Of course, there's no such thing as a typical seal. The point of the seal is that is the representation of an indi individual person. So every seal is meant to be different. That's how seals work. Nevertheless, there are some certain traits in the seals that I've seen so far that are generally shared. So we have a deed here, which as you can see, has quite a few seals on it. And these are fairly typical seals. Um, this deed dates to 1729. Now the seals I found have mostly been in red, red wax. I have seen some black wax, that's the next most common color. We'll be looking at that in the next slide. And then green wax and gray wax I have also seen. But red wax by far is most common. Seals are almost always round, as these ones here are. They're almost always rather small. Dime-sized is the usual size. Sometimes larger, sometimes smaller, but dime-sized is pretty usual. And then as for the images on the seals, and this is, of course, the most critical part of the seal, what kind of imagery does the seal have? And there are a this is where there's a wide range of different types. The, um, the coats of, of arms, heraldry type seals are by far the most common. And I, I've zoomed in on two of the seals on the deed here on the right. You can see they are both, they are different, but they both have arms on them. But there are many other types of, of images. So floral imagery, nature, nature imagery is, is very common. So trees, flowers, plants, animals too. Other animals are somewhat less, less commonly seen, but certainly notable when you do see them. And then, of course, there are also sometimes letters on, on these seals. Usually the letters can be mapped onto the person's name. So if you see two letters on a seal and you look at the name of the sealer, usually, of course, signed next to the seal, and you'll see usually that it's the first letter of the first name, first letter of the last name of this person, but not always. Sometimes. It's quite puzzling. You'll see two letters that have seemingly have nothing to do with the name. So then the question is, why did this person choose the seal? It's just a name of a family member, distant, a distant family member. The seal is passed down through the family. This was, was very common, certainly. Or is this, or do these letters mean something else that was personally meaningful to the sealer, but not the person's name? Or was this simply a person who needed a seal and they went and bought a seal from a person who had died or someone who didn't need their seal, and they went and sold it to um, a, a pawn shop maybe, and then person needed a seal for a deed, went and bought it, and didn't care that these letters were not their, their own name. There may, of course, it's difficult to know exactly what's going on, but there may different possible answers. Now, let's take a look at some of the more atypical seals. So these are seals that really stood out for me. And this is probably the most notable one. This is a woman's 17th century seal. So 17th century seals in general are more rare. The, the earlier you go, the fewer documents and the fewer seals you have. So certainly 17th century seals always stand out. And then um, women's seals are rarer than um, men's seals. Um, deeds are what I'm mostly looking at. Now, land deeds, of course, 
are mostly, mostly men selling, selling land. Widows also sell land, that's what we have here. And sometimes if a married couple sells land, then both the uh, man and the um, woman um, who's married to him seal, uh, but not always. So women's seals are generally much more rare. So this is a very rare a woman's 70th century seal. And in looking at the imagery, when I saw this seal really struck me. And so just taking a moment to pause and try to figure out what's going on with this seal shows, I think, how much we can glean about the culture of these people who are sealing from looking at the seal and then looking into the, the life history of this person. So this, 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 this woman here, Windsor, um, Rebecca Windsor, who was presumably not letter, you see she marked with the letter R there. Um, she made this deed after her husband died in 1679, and she's noted as a widow in the deed, so presumably pretty soon after her husband died. She was a tavern owner in, in, in Boston, so not, a, not at the highest status level, middling status, I, I, I would say, um, but yet she does have a very, very nice deed, and you can see it's in black wax rather than the typical red. And as for the image on it, now I'm open, of course, to what people think about what this, what this image is. But for me, it seems that there is a baby in swaddling clothes or some sort of cradle on the bottom, and then a bird over it. And what is this bird? Now the um, the um, the pelican is my theory. The pelican in the myth of the of the pelican is a representation of the mother who gives up everything for her children. The pelican is, was thought to cut or to bite its breast so that its blood, the mother bird's blood, would flow out and feed her children, which seems to be what's happening here. And I think that that is not a flaw in the seal, but that is a drop of blood rep represented there coming from the breast of the pelican to feed the human baby. So it's an interesting mixture. Usually it's bird babies, pelican babies, but in this case, it's a seemingly a human baby, but those could be bird eggs, right? So this seemingly then is an image of the fact that this woman is a mother and she was a mother and she, this deed is deeding all of her land to her, her, one, of her, one, of her, one of her sons. Presumably she was in debt after her husband died and then sold all of her land to her son. So the motherhood image in that, in that, in that context in which a deed is, is happening makes sense. Of course, this raises some questions. Did she make this deed after her 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 husband died, right? Because, or was this a personal seal that she had, that she had previously? Now, most couples who seal have the same seal, and we'll see that on the next slide. So is this a new, a, a new seal, or had she had it for a long time? If it is her, her husband's seal, women often use their husband's seal, then the motherhood image doesn't make as much sense. So it seems to me that this was her own personal seal. And then, of course, the final, the black wax. Red is more common, but this was soon after her husband died. I do think that the black is the, the mourning symbol for the fact that, she, that her husband had recently died. But of course, we can only speculate. There's no definite proof of this. If I were to find other deeds with her seal on them, which is possible, then perhaps we, we could know more. Now, fingerprint seals are another fascinating type of seal, which I didn't think to uh, find. And fingerprint seals, when I found them, and here's two of them, similarly, the person pressed their finger into the red wax. So these people presumably didn't have their own seal matrix, but they used their finger. And this seemed to me to be rather modern. Of course, this was used much later. Uh, into modern times. When I did some research into this, it seems that this was an ancient form of, of sealing also. You see the quote from a prominent scholar of seals there. She says that fingerprint seals were used in um, much earlier, of course, than the 1730s in these seals here. And she says also that other types of seals in which you have the human body takes form in the seal. You have seals which are bitten and you have the hair of a person comes into the seal too. I have not found any of those types of seals yet, just these fingerprint seals, which are very numerous, actually, quite numerous. So if I find any of the tooth bitten seals or the hair seals, uh, I will be looking for them closely, and that would be something if I could find them. But of course, what this represents is that the seal is the essence of a person. It is meant to represent the person. And what better way to do that than to put part of your physical body into the, into the seal? So in fact, although these seals may seem simple, this is in fact the perfect form of the seal is the 
is the fingerprint seal because it represents you better than any other type of seal. Only you have this fingerprint. It's different from everyone else in the world, which I think was quite obviously known by, 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 by these people in the 1700s. All right, we have only a little bit of time left. Just want to briefly know pendant seals. Uh, these are seals which are hanging down from a, a deed. This is the more common type of, of seal in the earlier periods, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s. Once you go into the early modern period, pendant seals become less and less commonly used. But I still have found a few of them from the very earliest deeds. So this deed dates to 1672. We see a husband and wife sharing the same seal, a very nice rigged ship there. And they have these very nice red wax pendant seals. This is a, a, parchment seal, a parchment deed too. Most of the documents I find are paper, but there are some parchment documents. All right, just to close briefly here, my next step in my fellowship research uh, beyond looking at more seals is to look at other primary sources. I think, I think newspapers are absolutely critical source because they, they can tell us about people using seals in everyday life. And of course, seals were a critical part of everyday life. People carry their seals with them and they lost them. I think that these lost notices show that. They show that people kept their seals on their body because they were in use, I think, quite often, especially, especially by higher status people. And these seals, these lost notices also, of course, show that uh, seals had two faces. And this is something I didn't know prior to looking at these sources. They're, they say that there's two sides of the seal. So this raises further questions. How did people choose which side to use when they seal the document? Because, of course, on every document, there's only one side. So in looking at further sources beyond seals, it does raise more questions, which of course I hope to answer as I go on in my fellowship research. And I will, I will end there, thank you. Thank you very much. Our third presenter is Camden Elliott. He is a PhD candidate in history at Harvard University where he is completing a dissertation on the Anglo-Wabanaki Wars. His work sits at the intersection of Native American and Indigenous studies, as well as environmental history. His scholarship has been sponsored, generously supported, by the Huntington Library, the Clements Library at the University of Michigan, the Society of Colonial Wars in Massachusetts through the Massachusetts Historical Society, the New England Regional Fellowship Consortium, uh, among other institutions. Camden. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I've already so enjoyed the talks of my colleagues, um, and I find work fascinating, so hopefully we can chat afterwards. Um, I also want to thank uh, Kid and Cassie for setting this up, as well as MHS writ large, and of course the Society of Colonial Wars of Massachusetts for funding, uh, I believe, two months of my dissertation research. Um, was much appreciated. Uh, this was actually the first grant that I received um, for funding this project uh, at all, so I owe a genuine debt for that. Uh, it convinced me the project was viable at a very early stage, and um, I literally couldn't do my work without the holdings MHS has. So um, in the time I have today, I'm hoping to give a brief overview of my dissertation research and then end hopefully looking at what I think is a particularly compelling source I found here at MHS um, through the lens of environmental history. So my dissertation um, tentatively, very tentatively titled uh, War on Wobanak, Environmental Histories of the French and Indian Wars, uses the methods of environmental history to rethink uh, what is almost a century of warfare in the borderlands between New England and New France, um, or what is perhaps more accurately called Wobanak, the Donland, the first place the sun rises each day. So stretching from what is now kind of north central Massachusetts, across Lake Champlain, all the way to Nova Scotia, or depending on the time, across to Newfoundland, and encompassing parts of present day Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, PEI, New Brunswick, and Quebec, the Donland is the traditional homeland of the Wabanaki, so named as I said, because it is the first place the sun rises. Wabanaki uh, is kind of an umbrella term for a number of Algonquian speaking peoples. Um, today, it includes the uh, Benaki, Penobscot, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Maliseet. 
Um, though usually described as a confederacy, um, the reality is slightly more complicated when you get into kind of an indigenous confederacy. A lot of people bring notions of the Haudenosaunee. Um, I think the best way to think about the Wabanaki is simply as a people who understood each other's languages, sometimes came together during seasonal migrations, shared kinship ties that are not necessarily obvious in the historical record, and ultimately fight together during the period that I'm talking about. So the Wabanaki had greeted the dawn each day in this land for millennia. Um, as I'm an environmental historian, I think I'm kind of obligated to start with, since the ice sheet covering much of North America receded some 14,000 years ago, we love geological time. Um, <laughs> the exposed soil um, as a result of the glaciation means agricultural fields kind of require longer fallow periods. And so the Wabanaki practice a mix of agriculture and hunting and gathering. Um, basically the further south, the more agricultural, for the north, the more fishing, hunting, and gathering enter into the mix. But I argue they occupied areas of relatively similar forest cover, a similar stock of fauna. And in my work, the Dawnland is considered kind of a unified environment with gradations over space and time. And between the 1670s um, and the first Anglo-Wabanaki War, which is usually glossed as the Northern Theater of King Philip's War, uh, until the end of the French and Indian War, which saw the Wabanaki French allies and their lands circumscribed by an ascendant British Empire, uh, the Wabanaki and the British fought at least seven distinct wars. Um, they're usually glossed by a variety of names that portray them as uh, the North American theaters, if you will, of kind of European dynastic wars of succession that I can never keep straight. Um, and each chapter of my dissertation uh, covers kind of this full time period. So 1670s to 1760s broadly from the perspective of a different class, if you will, of natural object. Um, my chapters treat in turn um, pathogens, animals, trees, and finally the built environment. So briefly, um, the first chapter, and I should say only two of these chapters are actually written. Um, two of them are slightly theoretical. I won't tell you which ones. Hopefully they all sound uh, like they're fully developed. Um, the first chapter is called A Plague on Both Their Houses. Um, it rethinks the, I would say, deeply contested histories of smallpox and native mm -hmm. peoples um, across the Dawnland. It begins really with um, a smallpox outbreak uh, during King Philip's War that wreaks havoc on the Wabanaki and colonists alike. And the course of the disease, I argue, diverges sharply after this time where kind of the large colonial armies that are brought together to besiege uh, Quebec and then later Louisbourg, um, in essence, foster conditions for the disease to run rampant, while the Wabanaki actually adapt a variety of mitigation measures, um, ensuring, in my telling at least, uh, that the disease burden of smallpox in this period falls disproportionately on British colonists, not their native enemies. Um, my next chapter, uh, Beasts and Burdens, examines the ways in which animals become sites of conflict and important parts of the material and mental worlds of inhabitants and new settlers to the Dawnland. Um, I'm obviously indebted here to people like Virginia Dijon Anderson. Um, but I will just, as a way of argumentation, I'll use a kind of small example that I think uh, gets at the heart of kind of what I'm calling the changing mental worlds. Um, the forests that were home to the Wabanaki actually begin to look different. And I'm not just talking about timbering and masting, which is something uh, the next chapter touches on, but they begin to see red coats, right? They see this redness flooding through the green and brown hues of the forest. And it changes uh, the relations in their mind with one of the most kind of widely spread uh, animals, which is um, the small red winged blackbird. Uh, mm. The Linnaean name is, I never get this right, Aglius phoenicius. Um, it's found year round, it's deeply territorial, <laughs> and it breeds in the northern reaches. Um, but uh, some have argued it might actually be the most populous bird uh, in the North and South America. Um, but just as kind of red coats break through this muted forest color palette, so too do the red wings that lend it its English name, um, but the Abenaki actually come to calling it uh, Iglis Monsis, uh, which is, means little Englishmen. Um, it's the diminutive. So the forests during the Anglo Wabanaki Wars are filled with red coats of two kinds, you could say. But I should say most of the chapter is about the kind of more traditional domesticates 
Um, the next chapter, a Nursery of Empire, uh, turns its attention to trees and views them as sites of a tripartite conflict between the Wabanaki, British imperial officials, and American settler colonists. Um, I take kind of as a jumping off point the Abenaki leader Atawaneto, who at a conference in 1751 expressly forbid the English to quote, take a single stick of timber in the lands we inhabit. Um, and though they weren't seeking war, they said whether it would come depended only on the English. So sawmills and masting parties alike are sites of conflict. Uh, a dozen of the former at minimum are put to the torch during the wars. Mm -hmm. And the threat to the empire as it was as I think wood from the Donland, which stitches together large parts of the British Empire and its naval power, mm -hmm. meant that by looking at the natural world, I kind of reconceptualized the Anglo-Wabanaki War as perhaps not simply or not even as theaters of European dynastic wars, but maybe the inverse. Perhaps it was Anglo-Wabanaki wars that had European theaters. Mm -hmm. And finally, I turn away from trees um, to things largely built out of wood, the towns and villages which dot the landscape in a chapter titled Fortress Wilderness. Um, this chapter takes the ever evolving built environment of the Dawnland as its subject and is particularly concerned with settlements, the destruction of them and their rebuilding. Um, it's this dynamic which uh, gave the project its first title, which I believe is what Mass Historical and the Society uh, funded initially, which was Sisyphus in the Wilderness. <laughs> so forts and Indian towns and villages feature prominently and questions of land tenure and property come to a head. And so now I want to turn to the series of sources that show us how land is at the heart of this and how it functioned in kind of the competing worldviews of the peoples I study. And I should note the few sources we're about to get into, they all come from uh, a series of wars which are known by alternate names, depending on where one looks. Uh, Greylock's War, usually in the Vermont, uh, Lovewell's and Dummer's War, closer to here, Father Rail's War, if you want to blame it on the Jesuits, or the Maliseet Mi'kmaq War, if you're looking towards Nova Scotia. Um, waged in the mid-1720s, I unite these conflicts, uh, call them the Pan-Wabanaki Uprising for a variety of reasons we can get into later. Um, but at their heart, their disputes over land and land tenure. And one of the most visceral scenes of the war uh, begins just outside of St. George's Fort, um, also in Maine, as you helpfully pointed to the map earlier. Um, then the furthest reaches of Massachusetts land claim. And a Wabanaki man, probably a Penobscot or a Benaki, demanded that the British depart, since as he put it, quote, it is not your land. Now, the commander of the fort uh, replies that it's not his land, nor is it Indian land, but it's King George's land. And the native speaker retorts that he had never gone to King George to get any of his land. And from there, he remains pugilistic. He demands to know who bought it exactly, how much did they pay? And finally, he asks the soldier why he's lying and invites him to, quote, come out into the woods. Hmm. I, the British soldier, I think, wisely says, I'm just here to keep the forts and demurs on that point. <laughs> Um, the fort is attacked twice and nearly raised. <laughs> but I think if we put it another way, and in conversation with one of my absolute favorite sources I've seen at Mass Historical, we can see this as a Wabanaki man asserting his right and the right of his kinsmen to that spot. So in this, uh, it's a copy of a letter preserved here at MHS. And a veteran of the same Pan Wabanaki uprising, um, probably a Mi'kmaq man who is called Captain Nathaniel by his interlocutor, David Dunbar, then Surveyor General of His or Her Majesty's Woods. Um, Captain Nathaniel asserts to Dunbar that, quote, it is the received of every Indian that by nature each has an interest in every individual spot of ground and that it is unalienable, but they agree for peace and order's sake among themselves to have certain rivers, ponds, and tracts of land for their particular hunting and fishing. These use rights predicated on consent and, and environmental knowledge motivate the conflicts. And in 1723, there's a great report of a scout of Indians killing a man at Wells and quote, burnt a sawmill and 50,000 boards. There are the trees again. Um, so this conflict and I think the kind of French and Indian or Anglo-Wabanaki wars writ large were a rejection of the generation of deeds signed by Wabanaki leaders in the 1640s, 50s, and 60s. Ethno-historians have shown that they were aware of what they were signing, but 
I don't think the consent behind those deeds survives the generation that signs them. So the last consensual transfer of land actually happens around 1683, uh, before even the Second War. And as it became apparent that encroaching Anglo settlers didn't make good neighbors, the Wabanaki withdraw from European conceptions of land ownership consciously. It was their land by birthright, and they took steps to ensure they would remain its controllers. Um, and actually, I think it's fascinating that since the Brits need paper deeds and seals, um, the manifestations of these property abstractions that carve up the land so absurdly that we need surveys and papers to record it to prove it was theirs, the Wabanaki turn and attack those foundations. Um, at York, colonists couldn't prove title to any land after, quote, the Book of Records was taken away by the Indians and burnt. And uh, I'm well, I'm way out of time, so I just want to say that I'd like to think that my work is helping to rethink uh, narratives of colonization in the early American Northeast and some of the colonial wars that I think are perhaps uh, not as well known in the mainstream, although I imagine quite well known in this room. Um, so I hope in the not too distant future folks will be able to read a fuller version of this argument, and I want to thank you so much for your time, and I really look forward to questions. Thank you very much. Our final presenter is John Matt Kirkerer. He is a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of Chicago. His dissertation investigates the participatory foundations of democracy in colonial Massachusetts. It analyzes the relationship between the interconnected processes of institutional innovation, political le legitimate legitimation and popular domination by studying the formation, diffusion, and transformation of the institutional mechanisms based on popular participation. John. Uh, so I will, I'm going to start by reading two quotes from early 1640s. And because I think these quotes will really capture my interest in colonial New England and democratic part institutions in New England. So the first one is from John Cotton, uh, from his debate with Roger Williams. And this was part of a pamphlet published in London in 1644. And so here is the quote. In a large sense, authority after a sort may be acknowledged in the people, as when a man acts by counsel according to his own discerning freely, he is then said to be, and here he uses Greek and Latin, so otexius and dominus actus, which means either independent master of his own action or master of his yeah, activities. Okay, and then he goes on. So the people in all the acts of liberty, which they put forth, are dominus sui actus, lords of their own action. So this is the first quote from John Cotton. And the second one is from John Norton. And this was published in 1648. This is a response to a minister from the Netherlands who asked some questions about the practices of Puritanism in New England. And this is part of his response. And this was preceded by John Cotton's uh, foreword. And he says, supreme power lies in the fellowship according to the law of the circle in political groups. Their popular authority comes first, and when order is lost, it again became, be, becomes supreme, as the circle becomes as the circle comes around to the point at which it began. So here there are a few concepts that, that really interest me. And the first one is authority. What is authority in New England? How do we understand that? The people who are the people in New England. Then we use, have counsel. What does it mean to counsel? Then dominus, the idea of mastership, domination in New England. The acts of liberty of these people, how they acted and really institutionalized their rule. And then you have the idea of supreme power, the fellowship, which is to say the congregation. You have political groupings, the idea that religious and political spheres are distinct and separate. And then you have the order, the idea of order, which is sustained by popular authority. And these are direct quotes from these two extremely influential religious figures at the beginning of the colonial enterprise. So like this is really the main interest in my dissertation research. And my question is, why did the 
ordinary people, the common people in New England, but specifically Massachusetts, continue to participate in those institutional mechanisms, which were based on this idea of popular participation. Congregations, town meetings, general court, elections, all those, and militia companies, all these institutions were based on the idea of popular participation. So I'm interested in understanding the legitimacy of these institutions. And a lot of studies have been done on the idea of democracy in New England or whether we can characterize New England with, as a democratic mode of government. And many people came up with different explanations, but really they didn't ask this question of the legitimacy of the institutional order that was created and established in, in, in New England. So I'm interested in that idea of legitimacy. And my thesis is that, well, these institutions were kind of possible and they were created because of this idea of this emergent idea of popular domination, which meant that the common people as these normal ordinary people who were distinct from their representatives, their delegates, their the officers they elected, dominated these officers, these representatives, these elected officials. They dominated through their participation in these institutional mechanisms. So like the idea that you would have this very sophisticated constellation of participatory institutional mechanisms in, in a colonial setting comes from this emergent idea of popular domination. But of course, this is preceded by the history of Puritanism, Calvinism, but also the English past starting from the 11th century onwards. So I'm interested in really connecting this English past from the 11th century onwards with the Calvinist and Puritan revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries. And I think we can only understand the democratic beginnings of, of these institutions in New England if we really combine those two English and Puritan uh, pasts and histories. So that's my research. And I've been mostly studying church records here. And so I, I'm focusing on, on Massachusetts and specifically Suffolk County. And I study Boston, Dorchester, Braintree, and Dedham, the churches, town meetings, and all other institutions in those locations. So I've been mostly studying the church documents. And I've been reading all those records and very daily practices they had. And I, I'm interested in understanding how those daily exercises of authority were made and how they were legitimized by these common people. And so that's in, in that way, I, I don't really want to enter into this debate between continuity and rupture. I want to really see rupture within the continuous exercise of authority. So this would even like lead to, so I'm studying the entire colonial period from the beginning until the Revolutionary War, but also until basically the ratification of the first constitution of Massachusetts in 1780, which was again done by a popular referendum, which was the first modern referendum in world history. So like you, this idea of popular participation is kind of ingrained in the institutional structure of this colony. And so I'm, I'm studying all those separate institutions to understand what kind of legitimating uh, processes occurred when, when, when they were established and when they even changed over time. So these transformations are also things that I'm looking at. And so I can present some of the findings I found. But before that, I really want to emphasize this relationship between the pre colonial past and the colonial like colonial system because these people were as, as I just quoted John Cotton he was interested in classical Greek and and Roman Roman literatures they were fluent in those literatures they they studied those examples of democratic institutions and they were also interested in those constitutional debates around sovereignty that happened in the 16th century so Jean Baudin who was this person who coined the term sovereignty was widely read by all these Puritan colonists in, 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 in New England and in Massachusetts specifically. And they really made references to all those figures in the European political uh, intellectual spheres. So th this is definitely something I'm interested in. So, and I want to trace this lineage between those European ideas and how they were actually implemented in, in the new world for the first time because other other countries in Europe really couldn't have this new colonial uh, structure emerging and they couldn't really dominate the, the governing structure of their societies. 
So my research basically here, I, I, I was recently studying, I think last week I was studying some documents from the restoration period, so right after restoration, so in 1660 and 1661, and there were a lot of complaints by the loyalists to, to the crown about the Puritans themselves, and they were describing how, you know, free and independent these colonists are and how disloyal they are towards the, their king, and they were even uh, kind of providing refuge to, to the killers, the king slayers, uh, we, uh, and the names were William Goff and Edward Whaley, who were present in, in New England. They, they died in New England, and the, the king really wanted them back, but they didn't send them back. And in fact, John Norton, whose quote I just read, and who was the, who was the minister of the First Church of Boston, according to one of the accounts I read, even hosted these people, he even welcomed these people, and they considered these people as their their brethren, as their people themselves, and they they really kind of appreciated what what I guess they did by by killing Charles the first. But but so like here you see how they were militant in their ideas of popular participation and popular domination, and they they even wanted to you know, help help these people who were running away from the officers of the of the crown. And so that was one of the very recent findings I had. And so my goal here is to really show that democracy, we need to reconsider democracy and how we define democracy. And there is a tendency to associate democracy with no domination, democracy as non-domination or democracy as freedom of all. But we need to be more specific whenever we think about democracy, and that's why I'm interested in the case of New England, where, in my opinion, there were a lot of parts between institutional mechanisms, which could be, you know, considered as democratic institutions, but there was also domination. Of course, there was domination over non-included people, over women, over excluded populations, native populations, slave populations, and like none, basically for the 17th century, non-church members. But then you also had this domination of the people, of the common people over their representatives, over the, the delegated authorities in the colony. And they always had these accountability mechanisms. They audited their activities. They impeached some of them. They impeached their, you know, their even like ministers and everything. So this thing was always this conflict between the common people and their representatives was always present. And so I, I am interested in, this is more of my theoretical interest in this subject, I'm interested in really thinking about democracy in terms of domination and in terms of popular domination specifically, and to see that, okay, we, we are interested in freedom, we are interested in equality, but this equality and freedom can only be sustained if the common people take charge and if the common people control their representatives who will for sure have more power, who will for sure exercise more authority over these people. But as long as you have these participatory institutional mechanisms, which will facilitate the common people to control those activities, then you can actually have a robust and resilient form of government. So democracy can really include this participatory element and, this, and also the representative element, of course. So that's my interest, and I'm, I, I haven't really done re much research on the revolutionary history and the period, but I think it would also help us better understand the American Revolution itself and see it not as a rupture, but as maybe this continuous exercise of the people's authority and how they reacted to, to the crown's attempts to really control them through this colonial, more like centralized form of, form of control. And maybe that will even help us understand better our own societies today, where democracies are maybe dominant, at least in the Western world, but still the common people are not very much active in determining their own you know, policies and they are not really able to control their representatives and elites. So as opposed to this elite, elite domination, maybe we should think about democracy as a form of popular domination. So thank you.
Thank you very much to all of our presenters for sharing their wonderful projects with us. Uh, we are running a little late, so we are going to forego the Q&A. Folks who are here in person can continue the conversation after this is over. If you have questions online, please type them into the Q&A and we'll make sure that they get to our presenters. Uh, let me bring up Peter Drummy, the Stephen T. Riley librarian and our chief historian, and my challenge to him is to talk about how to use the library in five minutes. <laughs> I think we've had a wonderful advertisement for the range of work that can be done here, what we've we'll just listened to, and it's and talking about a long period in time, but nevertheless covered an extraordinary range of both topics and materials from our collection. We've been at this a long time. On the wall behind me is a map of Boston from the time of the siege of Boston. Um, which was given to the Historical Society in 1791 by one of our founders. So we were in the business of collecting. In fact, the first publication, more uh, to the point of our program this evening, the first publication of the members of the Historical Society was on uh, literally the back page of a weekly newspaper, the American Apollo, uh, the founders of the Historical Society, and I say the Historical Society because at the time of our founding, that was our name. There were no others. So um, I'm just using that for short. I realize many people are active in other historical societies, but we were first and only took on the name Massachusetts Historical Society at the time of our incorporation, which happened very soon thereafter. But in any case, um, they published materials that they had gathered and transcribed as the back page of a newspaper on the 1745 siege of Louisbourg. That was less than 50 years later, but already seen by people um, living here as being escaping from human memory and um, um, extraordinarily important in understanding here. The other thing about the Massachusetts Historical Society, more the, to the point in our collecting, is that the founders set out to collect complete history of this country. They were here in Massachusetts. Our collections are strongest for local materials, but the ambition was to collect systematically for the history of the new nation. Um, in, at the very beginning of the early national period. And in that respect, going back through the colonial period of uh, American history here from the 17th century and for the people living here at the time of European contact, the collection is really ambitious and national in scope. So there's much material from New England, but stretching far beyond New England as well. Now in using the library, and I think it's much easier to show you this than to tell you about it. So if anybody's interested, we're open late on Tuesdays and I'll be happy to show you through the library after our, um, uh, after our meeting. But we're here six days a week, Monday through Saturday and on into the evening on um, Tuesdays. Uh, we're open to the public free of charge. Anyone who can make profitable use of our collections is welcome to come and do research here. There's no need for an introduction or um, 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 some sort of um, level of education. Or um, if you have an interest in what we have, we're here to help you. At our website, we have much material about our collection, our um, online catalog, which is um, it has detailed descriptions of um, published materials and a range of other material. It has an overview of our very, very large manuscript collection. It's simply named, there's a link at our website. It's named Abigail, which supposedly has something to do with automated bibliography, but in fact is named in honor of Abigail Adams. And being the anniversary of her wedding, um, we have some material right outside of this room on display. So rather than try to talk you through here um, what we do and how we do it, it's whether it's this evening 
or later, um, get in touch with me. The best way to see this is to see it in person, both downstairs, the first floor of the Historical Society building is entirely taken over by our, our library, or even better, and I can offer this to you, not all together, but as individuals, um, take you through to see what this looks like. It's a very handsome building and our presentation to the public. Truthfully, it's a big warehouse behind the scenes, but it's a very interesting one. So that's my invitation to you. It's easy to get in touch with me by phone or through our website and uh, come back and see us uh, soon and often thereafter. But here are our wonderful ambassadors for um, what we do here. And if that's more than five minutes, I apologize. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, just a quick note for folks who are unable to join us here in person, we have a robust digital reproductions team and our library staff can help reproduce documents for you wherever you are in the world as well. So get in touch with us. Uh, I'm gonna say thank you on behalf of the Massachusetts Historical Society, but the last word of the evening is gonna go to a representative from the Society of Colonial Wars in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Charlie Newhall again. <laughs> Wow. Wow. You, you are all doing incredibly interesting, engaging work. I, I didn't bring enough paper to write down the number of notes I have, and I'd already read your precises before this. There's a lot of good things that are coming out of this, and I think a lot of it resonates with what the uh, Colonial Society of Massachusetts and uh, our uh, fellowship uh, together with the General Society is, is all about, and that is looking at um, the colonial past and connecting it to an individual who makes a petition, a portrait of herself, an incredible portrait of herself, and you know, taking going going from this pastoral allegory and then talking about freedom and virtue. What an incredible project that is, and very much about the colonial legacy of slavery, but also a call for freedom, it, just at the core of that. And then thinking about wax seals and how important wax seals are and legal structures are, and thinking about the materiality of that. That's it's just really exciting to think about fingerprints as kind of, as I think you said, um, the, the best representation, the perfect form of the seal, right? And, and, and I think about the people that uh, the Colonial Society members represent, how their legacy can continue on with a fingerprint, yes. um, what it, where, however that is. And environmental history. Um, the way you're recrafting, uh, is, it, uh, is it seven distinct wars? Um, and uh, I think we have a list of them on our, on our website. But to, to really rethink those and think about those in terms of land um, and thinking about the Wabanaki turning that English concept of land on its head. And, and how do they use that? I mean, we, we talk about the colonial an, our colonial ancestors in the Society of Colonial Wars, but we're keenly aware of Native American and Wabanaki as well. And in many ways, they were fighting for freedom in the, sa in the same way, ideologically, although very differently, uh, of course. Um, and then uh, and finally, um, thinking about participatory democracy and thinking about popular domination what an interesting concept, and as you drew at the end, we all are probably thinking about connections with today. Absolutely. But, but how do we think about that you know, popular referendums um, and uh, that popular referendum, the first Mass the Massachusetts Constitution, one of my absolute favorite documents um, to, to teach. I'm, I'm a high school teacher and um, always teaching about that. And I didn't know it was the first popular referendum in, uh, in world history. Um, that's just absolutely amazing. Um, so I'm just very excited about all of the themes that come out of the work that you're doing. Um, I'm intensely proud of the work that the Society of Colonial Wars is doing to try to support this kind of, exactly this kind of work. Um, and uh, all of you, I'm so glad you came. Uh, so and thank you to the Massachusetts Historical Society for making this possible together with the Samuel Victor Constant Fellowships in the Society of Colonial Wars. Thank you. Thank you.